contributor Brad Garrett here in Pittsburgh. Brad, we've got a crime scene behind us. They're still investigating this. You took a look at the affidavit and with the details of what went on inside of there with that shooter. So, so keep in mind, since Columbine, police have changed their tactics. Of, so instead of waiting, you go right to the shooter. Because let's face it, these shootings take less than five minutes, typically. So that's exactly what the Pittsburgh police did. They engaged the shooter that then went up to the third floor of the building. He now gets in a gunfight with the police. Several officers get shot. He gets shot. But they stop him. And the key is, because they went in when they did, it saved lives. And, and of course, we had snipers right in this house where we're set up in the front yard, right. upstairs in case they couldn't get him right. inside. What, what do we know about this suspect? Is there anything, you've seen these kinds of things so many times, is there anything atypical about him? No, from the standpoint that they're obviously full of anger and rage, but the important thing is that people like this gentleman are looking for an excuse to act. Now, did he use the serial bomber that we just went through as a motivator? I don't know, but their anger and rage builds up, and it's all about power, Martha. They feel powerless. They feel like people are overtaking their lives, and it becomes anger, and they vent it in a very hateful way, and so that's why he did this. And, and you saw the, uh, the online posting supposedly by him. Is he more radicalized online? Is it the atmosphere in the country right now? Is What do you see there? Okay, so it is a com combination of we're angry, we're intolerant, and that's getting promoted in certain venues around this country. And the problem is that people like this, they'll hook onto it. They're looking for something to justify their behavior. And if they can take on a situation like this location and start to kill people, it's like they've released it. I'm taking charge and I'm getting rid of people who shouldn't be here. It's all about dehumanizing individuals. Should he have been on the law enforcement radar? Could he have been? Would they have known? But the problem with that is that versions of him are in the hundreds of thousands across this country. And until you have information about somebody actually launching or building an attack online or talking to somebody or through an informant, what can you really do? What he's saying online a lot of people say online the First Amendment's going to protect them. So it's a real tough call for law enforcement. And, and, and with the, the mail bomber as well, right? I mean, there were threats of some sort. He was driving around with a van with targets on people's faces. Uh, but that, nothing you can do about and, that. And been convicted in the past yeah. of threatening people. So, you know, you could see his progression. I guarantee you, this gentleman, you're going to see his progression that led him to this building. Okay, thanks very much for joining us this morning, Brad. Uh, let's go back to George in the studio. Okay, thank you, Martha. We'll be back with you later in the program. Up next, the roundtable. How much of this violence is being sparked by our political climate, and what will it mean for the midterms? We'll be right back. This week with George Stephanopoulos, sponsored by Prudential. And it's a terrible, terrible thing, what's going on with hate in our country, frankly, and all over the world. And something has to be done. This is a dispute that will always exist, I suspect. But if they had some kind of a protection inside the temple, uh, maybe it could have been a very much different situation. The so world is a violent world. And uh, you think when you're over it, it just sort of goes away. But then it comes back in the form of a madman, a, uh, a wacko. And I think they should stiffen up, stiffen up laws. And I think they should very much bring the death penalty into vote. They should pay the ultimate price. President Trump's first reaction to the shooting at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh on his way to a campaign rally in Illinois yesterday. We're going to talk about this all on our roundtable now, joined by our chief political analyst, Matthew Dowd, national correspondent for The Washington Post, Mary Jordan, Raihan Salam, executive editor of the National Review and author of Melting Pot or Civil War, A Son of Immigrants Makes the Case Against Open Borders. Former Trump Homeland Security Advisor Tom Bossert and Democratic strategist, former DNC Chair Donna Brazile. Um, Matt, I said at the top of the show, we shouldn't be surprised by this, all the events of this week. Were they inevitable? Um, I, I think we should be surprised that something like this takes place in America in the course of the last week. But I think much of it's been predictable in this and with the times we're in and where we are today. I'll quote the philosopher Yoda. <laughs> which says the path to the dark side is fear. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering. 
And I think we're at a moment in time where we have to speak compassionately, clearly, and calmly in the, in the times that we're in. And I think our leaders, and I would put specific responsibility on the president, that he has an obligation to try to rid us of much of this tribalism. And I think what he's done um, over the course of the last few years is help foment this. I'm not saying he's responsible for what happened in Pittsburgh. He's not responsible for what happened uh, with, the, with the bombs that were sent. He's not responsible for what happened with, at the supermarket. But all of those have a commonality. A white national supremacist shot two blacks at a supermarket. A white national supremacist sent 17 IEDs across the country to Democratic leaders. A white national supremacist just killed 11 Jewish people in a synagogue in Pittsburgh. And in the course of that, I think the president has not actually allocated resources to deal with it in the right way. And he also has not spoken in the right way in the course of this that has diminished the hate. Tom, you had to work on domestic terror when you worked for President Trump as Homeland Security Advisor. How do you respond? Yeah, well, I'm sad to hear it all. To be honest, even this morning, the lead into this was a focus on the president's comments as he walked out to the helicopter instead of the focus on the quote I was hoping to see in which he condemns anti-Semitism and violence in this country. And so it's a hard but, but, time but, but, to claim but, but, he's got a big... But, but, but big, wait a second, wait a second. Big right megaphone. That was his first response. Right. That was his instinctive response to what happened. No, but what he then said in the speech was what was scripted for yeah, him. I don't believe that's accurate. First off, he has control over what's scripted in those speeches. Was, you're saying that wasn't accurate? That was his first response? No, because it wasn't his first response. It was on his way out of response to a question thrown at him about gun control. So the question was already political and the reporters in the gaggle were saying, what are your thoughts on gun control in response to this issue? His actual response to the American people was that we have no tolerance for violence in this country or anti-Semitism. To be honest, whether you, you play it or not or agree with me or not, that's what I want to promote today. But Tom, when a child has an absent parent, the other parent steps up or the, the sibling steps up. Yep. But when the country is going through a lot of pain and strife, you look for the president to be that parental figure. And yesterday, I think, at that moment, he was not the parent we needed. He was not the person that could heal us, that could talk about the pain. He runs away from his responsibility as a leader. We're all leaders. We all have voices. And his voice is the loudest voice at a moment like this. A moment, George, when our leaders, our former presidents, regardless of their party, they were elected by the entire American people. They, their lives were at stake, the lives of our attorney general, the lives of members of Congress, the lives of people who are just regular people. People in the and, media. And, and people in the media. Yeah, people at this table. But when you're out talking to voters, because we're days away from a very important election, what they say is the country is in need of repair. And what they want is a repair man or a repair woman to fix this. And I think the 2020 election is going to end up actually no, being on this point. People do say that, but do they vote with, to back up what they say is one of my questions. Well, it depends on if, who we're giving them. And I think this is one of the key questions for 2020 is who, who are the Democrats going to give? Because right now we're still in our two camps. And right now it's about getting the vote out for this side or this side. And it's either you're with this whole election in days to come is about Trump. Are you with him or are you against him? And, and we'll see about how the turnout turns. One thing I feel compelled to say is that you had brave women and men, police officers, who yes. intervened in Squirrel Hill. You had folks who stopped that shooter in Louisville, Kentucky. You had these people putting themselves in grave danger. These are women and men who have different political beliefs. Some of them are Republicans, some of them are Democrats, some of them support the president, others absolutely do not. Yet they were able to come together to work effectively. And I think that one dynamic you see happen is that we tend to invest a lot in our politicians. We identify with them. And so the problem is that you have these distinctions getting blurred. You have people who exploit a certain climate, people who are hateful, dangerous people. This gentleman who sent bombs threatened floor of power and light in 2002 with an attack. You have these people who will have a pre-existing narrative. They will cook up this hatred. They will connect it to various other things. But then there are other Americans who support this or that political cause who then feel as though, wait a second, are you trying to silence me when I have a legitimate concern about this or that 
issue, that further deepens the political divide. That further pits us against one against another. And I think it's really important to remember, again, these public servants, these ordinary, decent people, they come in many different shapes, sizes, and colors, and political convictions. So let's keep that in That's mind. That's something we learn again and again and again, but then that gets back to the question, what responsibility do political leaders have to encourage that and not its opposite? So. So this is not a both sides moment. And I think anybody that, that actually acts like this is a both sides moment, the president has a special responsibility at times like this. I think the country out there as a whole is not as tribalized as what Washington is, doesn't view politics the same as the president does, doesn't access those levels of hate and, and discourse that he does. But the president has a special responsibility. I'm not Michelangelo, but I can paint by number. And when you put string together the president's actions and you string together the president's words and you string together all those things he done, let's not forget to that, that what happened in Pittsburgh was because was ra the, this man was radicalized because of the language of the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. He was mad that refugees and immigrants were given, were giving whatever he considered special privileges in the course of this. And let's- Reference the caravan. And let's, let's also not forget that within this week, the president proudly claimed himself a nationalist and proudly castigates the immigrants, the struggling families, the refugees that are walking miles and miles. And as he does that, not all Americans, most Americans are good people and all that. The president, I, in my view, the president has to come to terms with this and come to terms with his own responsibility and where we are as a country today. Just briefly, just Matt, there's so much to agree with in what you said, but we should not lose sight of the fact that this awful villain is someone who accused the president of being part of a Jewish conspiracy. He is someone who sees the president as a globalist who is seeking to destroy the country. This is someone who is a noxious, poisonous person who believed ideas that unfortunately did not begin with one president or another. Anti-Semitism is a pervasive, dangerous threat in nations but, but around that, the world. That is, that is well, absolutely let's not lose sight so, 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 of so, why, why has it risen, why has it risen dramatically true. in the last two years? Why? Why? And the, and the reason why he castigated the president, this man, was because he didn't think the president hated enough. He didn't think the president was anti-immigrant enough. That's why he was mad at the president. He thought the president wasn't bashing immigrants more than he, more than he absolutely. wanted. Absolutely, and the fact that you have Jewish members of his administration who are absolutely central to his larger political project. He was deeply suspicious, and I don't think you can really attribute this man's hatefulness uh, solely to one political party or another. Uh, we should never... We should never do that. I mean, in 1958, a and Jewish synagogue. Was, uh, no, no, a I, Jewish I'm synagogue not was. To it. No, I'm saying not, it's part of the problem. I, I, I agree. Pretty close. I, I believe the leadership is lacking. But in 19, I'm a daughter of the South. This, this, this is a moment for us. I mean, my parents and grandparents had to come home and comfort us. Knowing that we were at danger just because of what we look like. A Jewish synagogue was bombed in Atlanta in 1958. Four little black girls were murdered four years ago. When is this hate going to stop? There's been a rise in anti-Semitism, a rise in racist, violent rhetoric in our country. I don't blame the president alone. I blame all of us. We have to tone this down, take responsibility for each other, come together because our children, what are we going to tell our kids so, so today? I couldn't agree with you more because I think one of the most dangerous things I'm hearing when I'm out there in different states is people are saying, you know, I'm more disillusioned and upset not because of Trump. He can lie, you know, he can spin conspiracy theories. He's one guy, he's always done that. I'm more disillusioned because so many people are listening to him. He's gonna leave office and these people that had Trump signs in their yard are gonna stay. The divide is dangerously wide and when I look at my neighbors that I used to go to the store with or sit at baseball games with, now I think, you know, they're anti me because they're listening to him. And this is why and, and, I think and, it's so deep and dangerous. And the attacks on the, on the media have worked. So, so, but he, the president still does have more than two years left in office at least. Yeah. So Tom, yeah. the question to you is then what does, it, what does he do now? What does he do in this moment? Look, you know, one of the things that troubles me about this is it just kind of furthers what everybody already thought of him. If you already thought kindly of him or gave him an open mind, you bring that to this table. And if you didn't, you don't. Fairness to both of you, I, I agree though. Uh, that there's some commonality at this table. This shocks all of us. This shocks the president. I know him. You don't watch this and, and, and you're not moved, right? He's moved by the humanity of this. I'm, I went to the University of Pittsburgh. I know Squirrel Hill really well. These are good people. 
I'll tell you what I think. I think it's a really simplistic response to say complex problems of the First Amendment that you heard Jay Johnson talk about, problems of the Second Amendment that are enshrined in our Constitution that are hard to untangle in this world against, well, let's just blame Trump. The problem here is that Donna's right. This has been going on for a very long time. And to have a holistic conversation about stopping hate and empowering our law enforcement with tools other than guns, which, by the way, they used really admirably. Uh, I'm, I'm with you on that. I, I'm, I'm kind of proud, I hate to say it, of the tactical emergency response that we saw and the casualty care that we saw. It's the reality of our world as a Homeland Security Advisor. We're going to have to see more of that. Uh, but I don't think the president's going to be able to, to sustain this level of rhetoric for, for a very long time. He's going to go out and make his case on the border. There's going to be a vote, and the people are going to come back and decide either they Well, well for example, he spoke last night in Illinois about you're going to be very happy because he's going to announce these, uh, these new emergency uh, actions on Tuesday to close down the border. Should the president keep the focus on the caravan in the wake of what we saw yesterday? Look, I don't think that you can stop pointing out the facts that there's an increased problem on the border. At this point, facts, right, just like Mr. Greenblatt espoused earlier today. It's not him trying to incite anything. He's just pointing out that there's a 57% increase. He called it a national emergency. It's at Mr. Greenblatt? No, the president. The president. Mm -hmm. At this point. He's also made people think how? that they're right on the Texas border. They're a thousand miles away. And, and, they, and it's ISIS and it's fear mongering. I mean, it is it's fear mongering. So it is missing. Look, 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 if, if, you go go, to, if you don't uh, allow the politicians in this politics. country to go out and try to and try to frame the issue to move policymakers to make a change, I mean, that's what we no, do. No, it's all politics. It's all about facts. You can't hang a murder around you know the facts as well as anybody about this. And the facts are there's more of a danger in this country today from violence committed by white supremacists than radical Islam in this country today. The facts show that. There's more of a danger of violence and crime being committed by white supremacists than by people sitting in a caravan struggling to come up there. But what does the president do? We're not allocating resources to deal with all these white supremacists. Forgive me. Just, Ryan, just, just Ryan. to get We're in here. We're sending 800 soldiers. Let if Ryan you look, get him. If you look at 2015, if you look at the European migrant crisis, it was a crisis in which initially you had desperate people fleeing Syria and Iraq, but then you had folks coming from Morocco, from Pakistan, from various other points. Because when you have subtle shifts in enforcement policy, you can get a big cascade. You can get a very big reaction. This is a serious issue. We need to talk about it calmly, dispassionately, carefully. But there is no question that the migrant caravan is a real legitimate issue. And when you have is it a, a migrant national cascade, emergency? look, when you have a migrant cascade of this kind, you can actually get a big political backlash. That's what we've seen in Europe since 2015. That can be a rolling emergency, George. And that's what we need to prevent. We need to remember that all of us have an interest in border security. It's not about pitting one group against another. And it's true that President Trump hasn't always been as careful as he ought to be in talking about it. But there's no question that this is a real issue. And 10 years ago, you have had bipartisan agreement on this. And it troubles me that now you can't talk about this in a measured, sensible have way. You know, what trouble, you know what troubles me? The president goes out and say Democrats are doing it. They're George Soros. I mean, putting a target on Mr. Soros. A philanthropist. He cares about our country. Here's a man who had to flee anti-Semitism as well. His, his family. That's George. Let's go back to what happened in Pittsburgh. There's been a surge in violence in the Jewish community, vandalism. There's been a surge in bomb threats. There's been a surge in cemetery demark. I mean, it, it's happening. We it need is, to focus it on is it. Terrifying. That's why we need it leadership. It is absolutely terrifying and wrong. It is the case that there are many Americans, many prominent Americans, who engage in our politics, and they become targets. This, however, is not unique to George Soros. I'm sorry to say, but it is this unique is a very dangerous to have climate. a president that is so combative and his style is attack. He boasts about, you know, I'm gonna hit them, punch them 10 times harder. At a time like this, when we want to tamper things down, look, Democrats want safe borders. Why does it have to be always the attack, the combative Trump style? The mistrust, the mistrust the temperature. at this point has, has grown to a point where I'm afraid there's not gonna be any necessary reform. It has reached an emergency level. Let's not use rhetoric that justifies violence, but it's reached a level in which thousands of children are now sitting in DHS custody and HHS custody without their parents. They've been abandoned. We're sitting in places where we've got an increase of 75%, I think, 
of family units crossing the border. That's creating a problem where the laws passed in 2000 and 1965 don't match up with the realities of Central as opposed to Mexican, Central American as opposed to Mexican immigrants. We need a change. The president's calling for it. People distrust the president. We're not going to get change. That's where we are. That doesn't mean we can hang a mass murder around his neck. So I want the but, rhetoric to be calm, but, but I don't think that the American viewers are looking at President Trump as a murderer. Well, well, no, we, we all agree. Nobody, we have, no one at this table agree. said no that. Not one person. Well, but, but what he is responsible for, what he is responsible for, for his that own, led to the murder. You no, know, here's what I said, Tom, and, be, and, I'll I'll careful. and I'll repeat it again. Parent. He is responsible for fomenting and using rhetoric that causes people to feel like that is normalized. And I'm not saying he's at all responsible for any of the incidents that happened this week at, yeah. at all in this. But let me go back to this. Yes, we need border security. Absolutely. Yes, we need solutions to the problems. Yes, we should be welcoming to immigrants in this country. Yes, we should be a country that deals compassionately with refugees in this. But we as a country are not allocating resources in this country today to the problems in a, in a priority order. The biggest problem of violence in this country today is from white supremacists. And we are allocating basically no money to deal with that problem. But we're sending 800 soldiers to the border to deal with a problem that's not only a thousand miles away, but there's been zero evidence that says these people are criminals. I think you're doing a disservice to right. the yeah. intelligence agencies, to those working in Homeland Security who are profoundly concerned about this. I think it is absolutely the case that you have a domestic terror threat, but here's what I worry about. Does that. the president ever talk about I'm, white supremacy? One thing I'm worried about is that in the early 1970s, you had 2,500 bombings in this country. Imagine if that happened today with social media, with virality, with the tendency to match one party's rhetoric with another party's rhetoric. We're constantly egging one another on rather than looking to those first responders and how they work together I, across that divide. Say, in talking to real people and voters, you know, in Georgia, they just miss the America that they love. They're like, who, we are not these people. They just want someone to put to words, you know, an aspirational place to talk about things like the melting pot as opposed to kind of the... the